standing here for mass incarceration, over criminalization. It's becoming clearer and clearer that by its own stated aims of reducing drug use and protecting people from criminals, the war on drugs might just be the most radically failed policy in modern political history. So maybe now is the time to start planning, to start asking ourselves what happens after the war. This is not just a matter of waving a wand, saying all drugs are legal now, and selling cocaine to kids at your local supermarket. The process of actually legalizing and regulating drugs is gonna be complex. <laughs> Cannabis has already been legalized in Canada and several US states. But what about other, more potentially dangerous drugs? What does legal ecstasy, cocaine, or heroin actually look like? We're not talking about decriminalization here, like in Portugal, where the police won't bust you for possessing drugs, but the supply itself remains illegal in the hands of criminals on the black market. In this episode, we're talking about the big one, the end of the drug war, full legalization. Illicit drugs will be regulated and taxed like any other product. Your cocaine will be subject to health and safety inspections. Your dealer will have to start filing tax returns. At this point, it's probably helpful to remember that we already do have places where you can buy mind-altering, addictive, and dangerous drugs completely legally. Those places are called bars, pubs, and supermarkets. It's easy for you to stand there with a cigarette in one hand and a drink in another and tell us not to blow pot. You can get cancer. Your liver can rot away. Alcohol and tobacco are both potentially dangerous, but we've learned from experience that regulation is a better way to manage those dangers compared to prohibition. On the other hand, neither the alcohol nor the tobacco industries are particularly wonderful examples of humanity at its best. So maybe we can actually learn from this. Maybe we can use the regulation of other drugs to come up with better, safer, and fairer ways of doing things. We do learn the lessons from mistakes that we've made with alcohol and tobacco regulation. Tobacco, certainly in the UK and, and much of Europe, has been increasingly strictly controlled in terms of restrictions on branding and advertising and, and plain packaging without actually having to resort to prohibition. When we do legalize some of these other drugs, we don't want to have that kind of aggressive lifestyle marketing, over commercialization, branding of some of these products. You know, we don't want cocaine brands sponsoring sporting events. And we don't want MDMA brands sponsoring festivals and, and, and nightclubs. In a way, one of the most nonsensical things about the entire war on drugs is the simple idea that substances like heroin, ecstasy, and ketamine should all be governed by the same law when they're all completely different drugs at opposite ends of the chemical spectrum. Each of these chemicals is gonna need its own system of regulation. And we'll start with maybe the most dangerous and controversial one of all, heroin. In 2018, 67,000 people died from drug overdoses in the US alone. The cultural cliches around heroin terrify people in a way few other drugs do. And the idea of legal heroin is hard for some people to even contemplate. Most people don't know that in the UK, up until the 1960s, heroin was prescribed by doctors. If you were a user, you could get a prescription and pick up pure medical grade heroin at high street pharmacies. This was called the British system, and it worked. In 1964, there were 342 known heroin addicts in the entire country. Meanwhile, in the US, which had taken a prohibitionist approach, the number skyrocketed into the hundreds of thousands. Considering the crisis we're in today, it's pretty wild to think there was a time in living memory when the entire heroin addict population of the UK could fit into your local pub. But there's a simple explanation. Doctors prescribing heroin means no significant black market and no black market means no people pushing drugs. And that leads to fewer scenes like this. I've been caught like 50 times for sex, but if you do it four or five times every day for, for over three years, of course you get fucking caught. If you prescribe users the heroin they need, they won't have to resort to crime to fund their use. In one stroke, you eliminate a major harm caused by the war on drugs. This is what Switzerland discovered in the 1990s. Their heroin crisis become so bad that the main park in Zurich had become a virtual open-air drug market, nicknamed Needle Park. In the face of fierce political opposition, the Swiss government tried out a program of heroin-assisted therapy based on the principles of the old British system of the 1950s. The results were dramatic. New incidences of heroin addiction dropped massively, as did HIV infection and the crime associated with problematic heroin use, like burglary and street prostitution. 
moving heroin and other opioids away from the legal market run by cartels to a prescription model run by doctors also makes it much easier to engage users with a load of other services, like medical treatment for illnesses and regulated drug consumption rooms. The more risky a drug is, the stricter levels of, of regulation are warranted and the more government intervention is justified in the market. And at the sort of more extreme ends of risk, for example, injectable drugs or injectable heroin, um, I think you can move essentially into a, a more medicalized, supervised, prescribed model. Can you go to the bottom and say that you will have a citron syrup? You need some acid. I don't enjoy this. It's just something that I wish I could uh, start with. And uh, I believe I'm going to be able to do that. This is not the life I recommend for no one. But places like this makes it more uh, controlled, uh, I think, and uh, less violent and uh, yeah, diseases and all that. There have been zero recorded overdose deaths in drug consumption rooms anywhere in the world. Heroin-assisted therapy has also consistently proven more effective than police enforcement and Just Say No style abstinence treatments in helping people give up opioids altogether. The Swiss have continued to expand their model to this day. These images from Swiss clinics in 2019 are a world away from the nightmare scenes we become used to seeing from the opioid crisis in the US and Canada. It would take the drugs away from the street. For me, it's too late. It's not about wanting to be sober. I want to not have my demons. I don't want to have all this anxiety. No. Uh, I want a dignified life. Now. What about the other end of the chemical world? The drugs that make you go up instead of down? How are we meant to regulate stimulants like cocaine, amphetamines, and MDMA? While these drugs probably don't need to be strictly prescribed by doctors, they're still too dangerous and too potentially profitable to be left purely to private companies. So the think tank Transform has proposed a system much like several US states have with alcohol, with government monopolies in production and sales conducted through pharmacies. I think what we're looking at is essentially something very similar to going to visit a pharmacy and getting over-the-counter drugs. You would buy a ration amount of a given drug product, clearly packaged, clearly labelled, from a trained individual who could give you advice on health, safety, harm reduction, and so on. The war on drugs has always been sold to us under the guise of child protection, a way to protect kids from the potential harms of certain drugs. In that, it has completely failed. Young people across the world are going out every weekend and taking substances without any clear idea of what they're putting into their systems. This is what a legal market regulated through pharmacies can fix. My daughter Martha Fernbach died seven years ago of an accidental ecstasy overdose. What she didn't know was what she'd sourced was 91% pure and she took half a gram in one go. That was my days as a parent over. I realised the policies were a big factor in contributing to this because they're not using the science or the expert advice that's very easily available. It just creates an incredibly lucrative black market that's completely unregulated. And how can you educate people as it currently stands? Young people have so much access to all sorts of substances and I think it's time for them to have easy access to good information and to have a grown-up discussion. And young people will listen to advice when it's given. Drugs charity The Loop have been testing people's pills and powders at UK festivals, letting people know what they're taking and offering them advice on how to take it safely. These drugs are all still illegal, but this small space of decriminalization gives an idea of just how life-saving these harm reduction strategies can be. This works. Do you think that anyone in the government might say this is encouraging drug use rather than detracting from it? I think it's an easy criticism to say that we're encouraging drug use. What we hope is we're reducing drug-related harm. More than 50 people a year die from ecstasy in the UK, and that figure's rising. So I think there's a desire from everybody on site to be trying to reduce drug-related deaths. A bit of a blue pill, okay. and I'm going to run it on this machine. It has an infrared laser so that you can then identify illegal drugs and legal drugs and lots of other typical things that you'd find in pills. Right. Um, like baking soda or something? Like baking soda and like chalk and like, you know, things like paracetamol and all sorts of things. That What's the worst thing that 
Uh, Stuff gets cut with. Actually, we just had another another pill come in just now, which we might send a warning out about that contained a quite unpleasant drug called pentalone, and that caused someone to have a psychotic episode last night. So here, really? Here, yeah. So this is just a regular ecstasy pill. This is yeah. It looks like it contains MDMA, but there's not much MDMA in this pill at all. You know, as a parent, you're trying to keep your child safe and sort of looking at these substances and trying to sort of say, well, if you if I can't talk you out of it, then this is how to do it safely. You know, harm reduction, I knew nothing about the subject of harm reduction. As much as the war on drugs was supposedly designed to protect people from drug abuse, it turns out that what people really need protection from is the war on drugs itself. Over the last century, these policies have destroyed countless lives, hitting the poorest and most vulnerable the hardest. But ending this war actually offers some real opportunities. It's not often humanity gets to imagine an entire new global industry from the ground up. Prohibition has not worked. What we need is a solution to protect people from the harm that drug use can cause.